Welcome to Lecture 3 in the Poetic Books of the Old Testament class for the Blue Ridge Institute for Theological Education, OT 512. We're very excited to continue this class as today we look at Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon, and the Book of Lamentations. So let's dive in. Welcome to this lecture on the Book of Ecclesiastes. We begin with considering the name Ecclesiastes. The name in Hebrew is actually Koheleth which is often translated as the teacher, but really the word kaheleth comes from the Hebrew word kahal, meaning to assemble, to gather, perhaps gather for teaching, but the idea is really one of assembling people together. Actually, the verb kahal, to assemble or to gather, is never used in Ecclesiastes, just the name, koheleth. The word for assembly, or koheleth, in Greek is ekklesia, so this is one who forms ekklesias, or we might say an ekklesiast, which in Latin is Ecclesiastes. Technically, every time we have the word the teacher in our English Bibles, we have the Latin word Ecclesiastes. So Ecclesiastes 1.1 1, 1 in Latin begins verba Ecclesiastes. In Hebrew, divre koheleth, and in English, the words of the teacher, or the preacher, or the gatherer, or the assemblier, or the convener, and so on and so forth. But just who is koheleth? First, Koheleth says that he was king in Jerusalem, chapter 1, verse 12. But does that mean that he's no longer king? How's that possible? The word was could mean I became, although that meaning usually then has a lamed preposition on the next word, indicating what the subject became, and that is missing here in this verse. So how can Koheleth say that he was king? Or we could go with the English standard, I have been king, in other words, suggesting I still am, which is a possibility, tough to tell in Hebrew. Although if the emphasis is that Koheleth is king, one would simply expect him to say that. Why doesn't he just say that he is king, or I am king? Not to mention the fact that he says he was a son of David, so that at least narrows it down somewhat to the kingdom of Judah. But then why not just come right out and say, this is Solomon? The other books of Solomon give his name, Proverbs, the Song of Solomon, so why not this one? When you look at the overall story that Koheleth is telling, Solomon makes sense. Solomon was wise enough to go through the struggle that Koheleth is going through here. Solomon was rich enough to go through the struggle that Koheleth is going through here. This simply sounds like the type of search that Solomon would go through. Solomon was king in Jerusalem, a son of David, so Solomon fits all the requirements. The only issue is that Solomon refers to himself being wiser than all the kings before him in Jerusalem which technically is just one person, David. Although Solomon could be referring to Jerusalem the way that we refer to Washington, even though there was a national capital prior to Washington in the United States, a fact that is often forgotten, we still refer to all presidents living in Washington, even the ones who didn't actually live in Washington. And so Solomon could be using Jerusalem in this way. He could even be saying that he's wiser even than the Jebusite kings that lived in Jerusalem. Of course, there are those like Dr. Van Gemmeren who want to say that this is someone pretending to be Solomon, putting on the persona of Solomon. But this is impossible to prove or disprove because the more evidence you point to that it's Solomon, the more someone can claim that the pretender is just doing a really good job at pretending. It could be, of course, any king descended from Solomon, Asa, Uzziah, Hezekiah, Josiah. But again, Solomon makes the most sense. 2,000 years of history, and none of the objections against him are all that convincing. In the end, we're left saying with Bullock that the author is impossible to determine. We can't say definitively who Koheleth is. But while tradition and church history are not infallible, they should carry some weight in pointing to Solomon. One of the real questions that faces us as we approach the book of Ecclesiastes is why is Koheleth so negative? His negativity may be part of why some scholars shrink back from saying that Koheleth is Solomon. Perhaps they're afraid to put words that are so negative in the mouth of one who is said to be so wise. Of course, this problem goes away if we view Solomon's negativity as having a good inspired purpose, a good message. But in modern scholarship, that view is very rare. Koheleth is viewed instead by most scholars as a pessimist, someone who rejects hope in God completely, someone who rejects the law and lives a carpe diem, eat, drink, and be merry sort of life. Of course, if that's true, if Koheleth is a pessimist, why is this book even in the Bible? 
Many scholars think that Koheleth is actively trying to counteract the positivism of Proverbs, as though Proverbs is too naive, thereby making Koheleth a corrective against the perspective of Proverbs in the Wisdom Psalms. This is due to a misunderstanding of the book of Proverbs. They're Proverbs, not promises. They're not just positive principles. Uh, they are observations of life to be evaluated and used appropriately in the light of wisdom. This approach also requires a misreading of Ecclesiastes itself. Koheleth is offering a critique of wisdom, but he's not critiquing the wisdom of the Bible. This seems to be where scholars are divided. Koheleth is on a spiritual journey, or as Bullock points out, he's telling us about a spiritual journey he already took. This book is the results. But on this journey, Koheleth has tried everything, everything under the sun. And his conclusion is very simple. Everything is vanity. That word for vanity is hevel. In Genesis 4, we translate the name hevel as Abel, but the meaning is the same. Hevel is a breath. But what does Koheleth mean by that? What does he mean by breath? It's fairly clear that it's a metaphor, but many have offered their own suggestions then of what that metaphor is trying to get across. Bartholomew and O'Dowd translate the word as an enigma, stating that Koheleth's point is that one simply cannot get a grasp or an understanding of a part of life. Michael Fox popularized the idea of absurdity, although the word's never used that way. Stuart Weeks says we should understand it as an illusion. He suggests futility. Indeed, one gets the idea that if Koheleth were to try and give a definition of Hevel, he would say that any attempt to define Hevel is Hevel. Vanity is the word of the old King James, and while that word has different connotations today, the word originally intended works quite well. It's vain, it's fleeting, it's like a breath, like a mist, it has no lasting value, which can be shocking when you consider that Koheleth says that hard work is vanity, wisdom is vanity, piety is vanity, even deeply followed religion is vanity. Again, this is what led many scholars to conclude that Koheleth is negative and can't be Solomon. The man who said such incredible words about wisdom in the book of Proverbs. Surely this is not the same man. Leo Perdue pulls no punches when he says that Koheleth reaches the eventual conclusion that all is vanity because God doesn't care. Yes, Perdue admits that Koheleth finds God sovereign, but also uncaring, cold, and heartless. Perdue suggests that Koheleth still viewed this being, quote, in terms of a divine power concealed in a canopy of divine mystery that emitted only the characteristic of capricious, end quote. That's an incredibly negative view of God, but it's a view that many scholars believe Koheleth actually has, that Koheleth has so critiqued the values of life, there's not even hope in God. Crenshaw says, quote, God conceals knowledge. Such an understanding of God has left no place for personal relationship, however desirable it may have been, end quote. This is the result of Koheleth's search as far as they are concerned, he has realized all is vanity, and the only hope for purpose is enjoyment in life with a capricious God may bestow upon some of his creatures. To some degree, much of scholarship would agree that Koheleth has indeed critiqued everything under the sun and realized that it's vanity. However, it's where one goes from here that really determines one's understanding of the book. One could perhaps agree that Koheleth has realized there's little value in following after God, or anything else for that matter, which, in the case of Leo Perdue, leads him to assume that Ecclesiastes is an emphasis upon humanism instead of theology. He says, quote, It is a human question he seeks to understand, and it resides in the activities and experiences of the engaged mind of the reflective sage. End quote. As this reflective sage, Koheleth observes the world around him from a humanistic, man-centered way of living because God doesn't care and cannot be influenced. Yes, one should still fear God, follow his commandments, but not to get anything in return specifically. Purdue believes Koheleth was writing from later in the time of the exile or after, and is thus influenced by Greek thought, a Greek humanistic thought of the skeptics. So Koheleth finds, quote, tranquility in non-assertion, which is really a skeptic sort of way of talking. Purdue has no problem saying that Koheleth stands opposed to the rest of scripture, and there are other scholars who also see no approach, uh, problem in this approach of not having a reason to ensure that Ecclesiastes jives with the rest of the Old Testament canon. That's not a starting assumption for particular branches of Old Testament academia, never a key part of their interpretation. They fail to realize that Israel would not have allowed conflicting books to enter into the canon. Other scholars, though, offer a different view than the extreme view of Purdue and even Crenshaw, 
weeks view, Koheleth has come to realize that life cannot be understood. Wisdom can be a good thing, then, and is certainly to be preferred to folly, but it offers limited gains and comes at a cost. It is restricted in its scope. Humans can never really find out what's going on, whatever the claims of the wise, and it may be better just to hedge one's bets and get on with things than to try to understand and predict them. Koheleth's view of wisdom is consequently rather ambivalent, according to Weeks. Uh, for Weeks, Ecclesiastes is not about a humanistic search. If there, he says, quote, is empiricism, there's also a strong critique of empiricism, end quote. He, Koheleth, sets severe limitations upon the human capacity to know the world and to achieve anything. And in relation to the fear of the Lord, Weeks says, quote, Koheleth emphasizes relationship with deity more than individual deeds, end quote. We are compensated not with permanent possession of what we accomplish, but by the ability to take pleasure in accomplishing it. This also is opposed to Purdue and even Crenshaw, who deny that relationship with God is even possible, that God even cares. Weeks's view is also less negative than Purdue's view of outright pessimism, but to use Weeks's words, still rather ambivalent in one's approach to life. Uh, Weeks has been greatly influenced by books from the ancient Near East similar to Ecclesiastes, such as the Epic of Gilgamesh, where Gilgamesh is told to forget immortality and enjoy this life, or the ancient uh, story The Harper's Son, which we actually get from the tomb of King Intef, where the son is told to focus on life instead of an unknown afterlife. It's not that God doesn't care, which makes life vanity. It's that human beings lack the ability to really know that makes life a delusion. So we're simply left with enjoyment and pragmatism. Or, to use Mark Sneed's phraseology, Koheleth, quote, exhorts a carpe diem ethic, enjoy life before you die. According to Sneed, Koheleth realizes that life is vanity, so simply live a balanced life, making the most of every moment because we're all going to die in the end. Stuart Weeks occasionally offers a similar thought, quote, deeds do not trigger instant consequences. If one has the proper attitude, or whatever it is that makes fear of God, one will not be condemned for occasional sin, and such sin may actually be necessary for self-preservation, end quote. Although Weeks does not seem consistent in this viewpoint, emphasizing pragmatism with God out of fear of God rather than seize the day, for Sneed, live in the fear of God just means in relationship with God. In the meantime, you can live however you want because it's all vanity anyway, and even God's judgment is vanity and unpredictable. Thus, Sneed, who cites Wybray, suggests that Koheleth uses the pessimism of the book to reinforce a notion of carpe diem, to point out that the only thing to do is to enjoy life. Sneed, though, at least is aware of the fact that Koheleth's view is a pretty controversial approach to life, to seize the day and that this might mean that the laws of God are not the path of wisdom because that path is too extreme, too pious, and does little good anyway. Weeks realizes the same, questioning how such a book made it in the Bible in the first place. Both Sneed and Weeks realize that Koheleth's view seems to be only on this life, not the life after. Trumper Longman suggests that Koheleth is actually a presentation of a narrator who's using Koheleth as a foil for a foolish humanist, the idea of a narrator isn't all that odd of a suggestion. Some see the narrator as giving the intro and the epilogue. Others point to the narrator in chapter 7, where Koheleth is mentioned in the third person, just as in the intro and the epilogue. Three levels is a bit unique. Uh, Longman suggests that two Proverbs sections are actually spoken by Wisdom herself. But as a narrator, both Trumper Longman and Mark Sneed suggest that the thought of Koheleth is counter to the thought of Proverbs. Not as counter as Purdue suggests, but still, this carpe diem, seize the day approach, with only a little concern for the law of God or the fear of the Lord, is strikingly different from other books of wisdom. But both Longman and Sneed, following a suggestion from Michael Fox, conclude that the narrator disagrees with Koheleth and is actually presenting Koheleth as a fool. The reader is left to agree with unorthodox Koheleth or the more conservative frame of the narrator. The narrator is trying to get us to see the folly of Koheleth. Derek Kidner actually suggests that Koheleth may be having a debate with himself, so that what we see is not a bad critique, but Koheleth critiquing himself, or maybe debating himself, until the end when Koheleth points out that his own humanistic approach was wrong. The difficulty of these theories, as highlighted by Stuart Weeks, points out that Koheleth makes a bad foil for foolish people, 
because most people would never ask the questions that he asks. Perhaps questions raised by businessmen, as Weeks points out, but not sages, not the average person. If anything, says Weeks, quote, we might be invited to critique his materialism, end quote. Instead, Weeks suggests that Ecclesiastes is not written as much to present a right answer, but to provoke thought. He admits in the end he doesn't know how to read the book. You can see, then, the interpretive problem that we have with Kohelet. He's negative. He's pessimistic. The question that scholars wrestle with is, why? Why is he negative? Is it because, as Purdue suggests, Kohelet has given up on God? Is it, as Crenshaw says, that God has given up on Kohelet? Is Weeks right that we should ignore the vanity and just fear God pragmatically enjoying life, or with Sneed, that we should ignore the vanity and seize the day? Or, as Sneed also adjusts, along with Longman, should we realize that Koheleth is pessimistic but incorrect and not the last word because the narrator has the right viewpoint? This is the great question of Koheleth. What do we do with his negativity? And what do we do with his negativity and what he is critiquing? Is he critiquing other wisdom literature? Is he critiquing Jewish tradition? But what I want to suggest, and there are several scholars who take this viewpoint, although they seem to be in the minority, is that Koheleth's negativity is not unorthodox, it's actually very orthodox, which is why the book is in the canon. Very orthodox, perfectly in line with the wisdom of Job, Proverbs, and the wisdom Psalms. Koheleth is simply brutally honest, offering a critique of life. Kidner presents this as his preferred option. Koheleth may be showing what happens when you take man's view to its logical end. It's generally accepted that Koheleth is brutally negative. But why do scholars rarely stop and consider what I find to be rather obvious? Life is as brutally pointless as Koheleth makes it out to be. In that sense, then, Koheleth is right, not wrong. Life is seemingly vanity for all the reasons that Koheleth says. Now, I'm sure some scholars will say, yes, we said that. Koheleth is right. A good critique of the wisdom of his day. And many scholars have. But what they often mean by the wisdom of his day is the book of Proverbs. They often mean is that Proverbs is too optimistic, and it takes books like Job and Ecclesiastes to act as a corrective on the optimism. Thus, Koheleth is correctly negative, but negative against Proverbs, pointing out what Proverbs supposedly ignores, that life can be a vanity and a disorganized mess. But Koheleth is right that life is often brutally vain and pointless. But his conclusion is identical to Proverbs and Job, fear God, keep his commandments. The reason in Job only God has wisdom. The reason in Proverbs, only God has wisdom. The reason in Ecclesiastes, only God has wisdom. The difference in Ecclesiastes is that rather than telling us God has wisdom, Ecclesiastes shows us that everything else does not have wisdom. As Derek Kidner wisely states, where other writers would commend the light to us directly, Koheleth does it by making the darkness intolerable allowing the light only the rarest gleam to provoke the observant into second thoughts, end quote. Koheleth, Solomon, is critiquing any other possible source of wisdom and making it clear why we so desperately need the wisdom of God. Numerous scholars have pointed out that Koheleth is very clear concerning his methodology. He tells us in verse 13, I applied my heart to seek and to search out wisdom, all that is done under heaven. Again, verse 17, I applied my heart to wisdom and to know madness and folly. This is the means of the investigation. Chapter 2 gives far more detail, talking about the hedonism that goes into this, of buying slaves and building buildings, so on and so forth, of becoming great and not denying himself anything that he wanted. This is a pretty thorough investigation. But that's also the problem. As Craig Bartholomew summarizes, Koheleth's quest is informed by a, an epistemology dependent on reason, observation, and experience alone. This is the foundation of Koheleth's search for meaning. Ironically, Koheleth says back in chapter 1, verse 13, I applied my heart to seek and to search out wisdom. But this is the problem. Wisdom here in chapter 1, verse 13, as chapter 2 makes clear, is not godly wisdom. This is not the wisdom, as Bartholomew points out, that Solomon himself calls for later in Proverbs. He does not begin as Proverbs does, says Bartholomew, insisting, as he must, with the fear of the Lord. Instead, when Solomon begins his search, he uses wisdom, but by that Solomon means the more generic, skillful sense of wisdom, examination and observation. 
chapter 1, verse 16, my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. This isn't the basis for biblical wisdom. Bartholomew again says, quote, a high IQ is not the same as wisdom. This is Solomon's problem. He has started the search with the wrong kind of wisdom, a worldly wisdom. That's just foolish. But the real question that I would say we need to ask is why is Solomon pursuing such folly? Is Solomon here just being daft? How can one who wrote so much of Proverbs be so foolish as to start with human observations as his basis? Derek Kidner, though, was onto something when he said that Solomon was following humanistic reason to its logical end for the express purpose of pointing out meaningless life without God. Life under the sun, based on reason without God, is foolish. Is it out of the question for someone as wise as Solomon to carry the humanistic forms of wisdom to their natural conclusion? To test them all so that they're found wanting and pointless and vanity. Is that not Solomon's whole point? To point out that everything under the sun is vanity and meaningless and that instead, as Trumper Longman says, we should seek wisdom above the sun. Of course, yes, full disclosure, Longman believes that the narrator is ridiculing Solomon's search for wisdom, teaching the narrator's son that such a search is fruitless, suggesting that Solomon was not aware of the folly of his search, nor did he ever come to an awareness of his folly, just bitterness and frustration. Only the narrator is wise enough to come up with the answer. But is it not also possible that Solomon was aware of this conclusion as well? This is Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived that we're talking about. Seems like if Solomon can't figure this out, it would make him pretty foolish. But if Solomon went about this search on purpose, testing out humanistic perspectives, and then wrote about his search so that posterity would know where wisdom is found, a book still framed by a narrator, but at the very least, chronicling Solomon's conclusions rather than the narrator's, per se, wouldn't that fit what you would expect from the world's wisest man? I certainly think so. Even Craig Bartholomew, who also agrees that the conclusion in chapter 12 is written by the narrator, believes that the narrator and Solomon reached the same conclusion. Life without God is pure folly. This is the point of the book. This is why Solomon wrote, to communicate that a godless life is folly. None of that, however, detracts from the folly of what Solomon is presenting here. He is presenting folly, much the same way that Paul says in 2 Corinthians that he's acting like a fool, by boasting like the so-called super-apostles boast. I'm acting like a fool. Look what you drove me to, says Paul. And yet Paul does so to make a point. Here, too, Solomon, in the midst of his folly, is presenting true wisdom, because true wisdom must become a realization that everything other than God, everything under the sun, is vanity. Only in God is there wisdom and meaning. A life without God is pointless. Solomon is really calling his readers to this conclusion, but doing so, again as Kidner says, by highlighting the dark to reveal the light, by showing the folly of everything else, Solomon reveals that following after God is the only way to find meaning. The question then that Ecclesiastes is debating is twofold. Is there meaning without God? And second, is there wisdom, a real epistemology without God? The answer from Ecclesiastes that is offered by Solomon is no. God is the only source of true wisdom. As Bartholomew says, quote, an autonomous epistemology will only get one deeper and deeper into despair when faced with the enigmas of life, end quote. Instead, Ecclesiastes, like the rest of wisdom literature, is calling one to find wisdom, to pursue wisdom, not for wisdom's sake, that's vanity, but to find wisdom as a gift from God. Solomon then is critiquing humanistic wisdom, humanistic meaning. Ironically, Solomon is actually critiquing the very thing that Leo Perdue says Solomon is searching for. And to some degree, Perdue understands that. He says that Koheleth engages in a humanistic search, but Perdue also suggests that Koheleth fails in that search and ultimately gives up and is a complete pessimist. The same, to some degree, could even be said of Trevor Longman's view. Solomon goes on this search, a search that will end in pure misery. And the daughter comes along later and says of Solomon, see, what an idiot. Or, as Purdue says, someone comes along later and adds the epilogue to make Koheleth as a book not so seem so bad. But this means that Purdue misses the point, as do Weeks and Sneed, although Sneed as well suggests that maybe Koheleth is wrong. But Sneed does not view Koheleth as intentionally wrong. Instead, the narrator has to point out that Koheleth is wrong. 
in Sneed's view and Weeks and really Longman as well, it's as if there was no nar narrator, Koheleth's viewpoint would be anti-biblical. The narrator saves the day by saying no. In Bartholomew and Kidner's view, Solomon knows he's wrong. That's the whole point. So the narrator is a literary framework, not offering a different answer than Solomon, but a summary of what Solomon has been trying to say. Now, we might question whether any of this is really all that important. Does it really matter if Solomon's search and conclusion is unintentionally wrong or intentionally wrong? Everyone agrees that the search is wrong. Even Purdue thinks that Solomon is wrong, which is why the narrator has to try and make the orthodox conclusions at the end. But this is a really important issue because it affects how we read the entire book of Ecclesiastes. If Solomon is unintentionally wrong, is there any value in reading anything other than the narrator's conclusion? Well, if you're following Trumper Longman, he would say, no, it's good to hear Koheleth's under the sun viewpoint, he says, but don't dwell on it. In other words, as far as Longman is concerned, the 11 chapters of Ecclesiastes only have value as what is wrong. There's nothing in these chapters that should be applied to our lives in terms of perspective other than the avoidance of Koheleth's perspective. Really, I even wasted your time by making you read and dwell on the book of Ecclesiastes. He's wrong. We know he's wrong. So ignore that he's wrong and move on. Nothing to see here. Nothing to see. Move on. However, there are clearly parts of the book of Ecclesiastes that have a correct perspective in the midst of pessimism. Much of what Solomon says is true, such as the pointlessness of labor if you're trying to have something to show for it after you're done and after you die. In many ways, Solomon is right. There isn't much to work for except enjoying life. There is a time for everything, chapter 3, over which we have no control. We will die and leave everything to the next generation. There are limitations to human wisdom. All of these are true and factual and even biblical, a proper perspective. So should we skip over these? Well, if we think Solomon is simply a fool, completely misguided and unaware of his own error, then can we even trust Solomon when he says that these correct tidbits of worldview are correct? We'd be left treating Solomon like Egyptian sources or like the Epic of Gilgamesh. But on the other hand, if Solomon is correct that he's trying to uncover the pointlessness of a philosophy lived without God, if he's examining each and every aspect of life to show us that it is pointless without God, to show us the vanity of life but the need to turn to God, then each word of Solomon's is to be examined and carefully thought about. One more scholar I need to mention in passing is Wybray who caused Solomon, quote, the preacher of joy. Wybray points out that each negative passage is followed by a positive one. For instance, chapter 1, verse 12 to chapter 2, verse 26 says that pleasure does not satisfy. And yet the end, the call to rejoice, is in verses 24 to 26 of chapter 2. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 15, you can't know the times, you can't know the future. So you should rejoice in the present, in verse 15. There is injustice in chapter 3, verses 16 to 22, but you should rejoice in verse 22, so on and so forth. Uh, this is a good point here that Wybray raises, that Solomon is driving us somewhere. And yet Garrett's corrective is good that the direction we are being driven to is not joy for the sake of joy, but being driven to God. Plus, several of these so-called rejoicing passages still have a pessimistic feel to them like chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. There's nothing better for a person that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his soil. This, too, I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat and have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the busyness of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. The passage still ends with, this also is vanity. In other words, you should try to find enjoyment in your toil, but really you'll only find it if you find it from God, given as a gift to the one who pleases him. You cannot even enjoy work unless you have a relationship with God, which is ultimately the point of the book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by oil, the toil at which he toils under the sun? This question has to be kept in mind through the whole book until the conclusion. Chapter 12, fear God, keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. That's really the answer to the question. Uh, what is it that man gains by all the toil? Nothing. So fear God. As Gordon Spikeman says, nothing matters but the kingdom. Because of the kingdom, everything matters.
Gordon Spikeman in his Reformational Theology. Uh, we must then, as we work towards chapter 12, keep this question in mind. What man gains by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? Because that is the question that Solomon is seeking to answer. This continues into chapter 1, verse 4. I've seen everything, and behold, it is all vanity. Then verse 16, what is crooked cannot be made straight. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said, I've acquired everything, surpassing all who were in Jerusalem before me, and my heart has great experience of wisdom and knowledge. I applied my heart to know wisdom and madness. I perceived that this also was but a striving after the wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. It doesn't matter if Solomon chases after wisdom on earth, or madness, or folly, or knowledge. Ultimate meaning cannot be found in any of these. Chapter 2 gives a more in-depth reason. Everyone dies. Then I saw that there's more to gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than darkness. The wise person has his eye in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. That's certainly positive. And yet then Solomon says, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? If final meaning is found only in earthly wisdom, more than simple, practical, pragmatic tips to life, one will be disappointed. In fact, we could even say the same about biblical wisdom. Meaning is not found in, physical, in biblical wisdom. Biblical wisdom rather points to meaning. We can say that about the Bible in general. Eternal life is not found in knowing your Bible, in reading your Bible. Instead, the Bible points to where to find eternal life, to find it in Christ. In the same way, if Solomon was looking for lasting eternal meaning and being wise, he was not going to find it in wisdom itself. Instead, he needed to realize he was going to die. That's the fact of life, and not even being wise can stop that. And so Solomon admits in verse 24 of chapter 2 that enjoyment can still be found only as a gift of God. Just as wisdom is a gift of God, but ultimately none of those have meaning in and of themselves, because all die and leave all that they have toiled to the next generation. If Solomon's point is that nothing else matters, he could have just said that in less than a chapter. He could have just said, nothing else matters, in a big booming voice for effect. Vanity, 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 vanity. But Solomon doesn't do that. Instead, he spends 12 chapters of this book minus about half a chapter at the beginning, and most of the chapter at the end, explaining why it is all meaningless. What about it all is meaningless? In other words, Solomon is not simply being depressing, but didactic. He has a set purpose for highlighting each topic in this book, addressing each issue. So I'd like to look at each of those issues in turn. To do that, we're going to look at the book in chunks. But the question is, what chunks, even if there are chunks, some, like Dwayne Garrett, don't seem to think that Ecclesiastes has any sections. Instead, he approaches the book by looking at about 30 smaller segments, some of which repeat, almost a topical approach to the book, like one would look at the book of Proverbs, addressing issues like wisdom, wealth, death, politics, alternating on and off with no particular structure. Other scholars, though, suggest that the book can be divided into sections. Estes, for instance, thinks that there are four chunks in between the intro and the epilogue. He then breaks these bigger chunks up into smaller chunks, but in essence, he's suggesting that there is a linear movement to the book, a way in which the book holds together. There's the intro, chapters 1 through 2, chapters 3 through 5, chapter 6 through chapter 8, verse 15, and chapter 8, verse 16 through chapter 12, verse 8, and then the epilogue. I'd like us to take the chapter-by-chapter chapter approach, although if I had to structure it, I would probably say 1 through 2, chapter 3, 4 through 6, 7 through the beginning of the introduction. Uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, where Solomon says life in general is vanity and fleeting. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Solomon is asking what achievement is there in life itself? It's somewhat of an unusual place to start with the book. Rather than beginning with an introduction or an explanation of how Solomon is going to approach his search, Solomon begins by saying that if you stop and think about it, life has no meaning. This is one of the issues that this whole book addresses, and one of the reasons this book is in the Bible. Because how often do we stop and actually think about the fact that life has no obvious point? It's as though Solomon is explaining the problem in the first 11 verses, the problem that life apparently has no meaning before ever explaining in the next few verses why he's the one best qualified to answer the problem, to examine if this initial conclusion is correct, how to tell us he is going to go about addressing the problem of examining if life indeed has no meaning. As Craig Bartholomew already pointed out, this book is not so much a search for meaning as much as a report of Solomon giving us his conclusion of the search he already took. 
He tells us that no meaning has been found before ever telling us how he reached this conclusion. So beginning with verse 13, he begins to tell us how he's going to do this. I applied my heart, he says, to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. I've already mentioned uh, why this is a bad way to go about the search, but really, given the point that Solomon is making, this is a logical place to start, observation. Of course, the irony is that the more Solomon searches by logic and observation, the more his initial conclusion is confirmed. Chapter 1, verse 18, in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Solomon searched for meaning through wisdom, which was revealed in the end to be a pointless search. But it also showed that human wisdom cannot find the meaning of life that Solomon was searching for in the first place. Chapter 2 includes an attempt to find meaning in pleasure. The ESV subtitle calls it self-indulgence, uh, verses 1 through 11 of chapter 2. Solomon tries to find pleasure in laughter. But he says in verse 2, this is madness. After all, given his conclusions at the beginning, what's there really to laugh about? It's like when we hear a joke when we're really sad. We laugh, but then the sadness comes crashing back. Solomon mentions wine in verse 3, pursuing folly, construction projects, verses 4 through 6, acquiring slaves, verse 7, gold, silver, wives in verse 8. And yet what has Solomon gained? Verse 11. Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity. A striving after the wind, nothing was gained. If anything, these were just distractions. There is a tidbit of hope, though, one which Solomon will come back to. Verse 10, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward. Uh, Solomon will, will spiral back to that thought, but this was the only benefit, the only, quote, gain, the only meaning in all that was done, the joy of a job well done. Then in verses 12 through 17, Solomon tries wisdom, which he's already said is guiding his search, and only revealed the meaningness of life. But now he pokes holes in his own wisdom, calling the very foundation of the search meaningless. In other words, Solomon is quickly realizing that his wisdom isn't really going to help him because his wisdom cannot stop the fact that he's going to die. In fact, it is Solomon's wisdom, in a secular humanistic sense of the word, that brought him to the recognition that he's going to die, just like a fool. Verse 16 of chapter 2 for of the wise, as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come, all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. Might have been better to stay ignorant and a fool, because at least then you didn't know your life was meaningless. Ignorance is bliss, say some. But, and this again is the point of the book, we don't stop and realize that even in the bliss of ignorance, the fact that we're going to die doesn't change. Knowing or not knowing does not change the outcome. But Solomon is forcing us to know, to think, to realize the end. That's why David Gibson even calls his book in Ecclesiastes, Living Life Backwards. How Ecclesiastes teaches us to live in light of the end. This is the foundation, that life has a definite ending, and as Solomon has been showing us, very little gain because of that end. You can't take it with you, and he who dies with the most still dies. The wise, the fool, the king, the pauper all die. That is the reality. That is the cause of the meaningless, the vanity, the hevel, the, the realization that life is just a passing mist. It's not just true in Ecclesiastes, but also in James, chapter 4, verse 14. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Even James realizes what Ecclesiastes says. We're just but a mist, a vapor. And he reaches the same conclusion. You should trust in God. But this conclusion of meaningless, of realizing life is a vapor, leads Solomon to despair in verse 17. So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and a striving after wind. Verses 18 through 23 take this a step further. Not only does everyone die, but everything that a person toils for and works for gets left to those who are still alive, which on the one hand sounds nice, maybe leaving wealth and fortune to one's children and grandchildren, but as Solomon points out in verse 19, who knows whether he'll be wise or a fool. Maybe you work hard your whole life, amass a fortune, and then leave it to a son or daughter who's a complete dolt. Not only did they not work for it, they then squander it foolishly. What's the point? So clearly there's no actual gain from all of this work, so why work? There's a bit of a provisional answer, as Estes calls it, verses 24 through 26. There's nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. That sounds like a noble beginning, and it makes sense. If you can't take it with you, enjoy life now. 
that's not a hedonistic approach, although, as I've already said, some have accused Solomon of that. Uh, Solomon dismissed hedonism back in chapter 2, verse 10. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. No, instead, this is like the rest of verse 10. My heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was the reward for all my toil. The only gain, says Solomon, is enjoyment of work. Even the pursuit of pleasure will leave one feeling empty. You pursue the pleasure, but in the end, what did your pursuit get you? Nothing. It's kind of like going to one of those all-you-can-eat seafood places at Myrtle Beach. Uh, I went there once shortly after getting married, spent $30 or something a piece, and then, uh, given the fact that in 2004, when I first got married, that was a lot of money, I realized that I wasted my money because I f walked out feeling full, but then just a few hours later, I had to eat again. Meaningless. Vanity. What's the point? The point, says Solomon, the only point is simply to enjoy the joy of the journey, to find pleasure in the toil itself. Enjoy the meal. Enjoy the work. Enjoy those fleeting pleasures of life, walking on the beach, a pretty sunset, but realize that beyond that, simply enjoyment, there is no point. And yet Solomon admits even this enjoyment is only from the hand of God. This also, he says in verse 24, I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he's given the busyness of gathering and collecting, only to give it to the one who pleases God. This also is a vanity and striving after the wind. I think Solomon's point there is in that word striving. You can't strive after enjoyment because when you do, you feel like I did after I left that restaurant in Myrtle Beach. You strive after enjoyment, then you have to strive after it again and again and again, never quite finding satisfaction. But if instead we recognize it all as a gift from God, we can enjoy the enjoyment when it is given without stressing over having to search for it again, nor stressing when it is not there. Sometimes life is enjoyable. Sometimes life is horrific. The joy is not because we necessarily did anything, not because joy and was our only goal, but because of our attitude in approaching God, humbly relying on him to give us enjoyment in the little things, the big things in his time, which is the point of chapter 3, in his time. Uh, because of that phrase in verse 8 of chapter 3, a time to love, this is often used at weddings. However, if we stopped and thought about what Solomon is really saying, we'd see that it's a bizarre passage for weddings. The point is not that there is a time for love, but that there is a time for love, but that time is completely out of the control of human beings. We have no control over time. We can't control when we're born, when we die. We can't make any time a particular type of time at all. Instead, only God is in control of time. Verse 11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. And yet Solomon also says that God has put eternity in man's hearts. So God alone is in charge of time, but we get a sense that there is time, even eternity. Uh, that's not referring to faith. This isn't Solomon's version of Romans 2, where God has written the law on their hearts, but instead the sense that there is time, and thus there must be a timekeeper. And frankly, that timekeeper is not us. The rest of verse 11 yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. We know there's a time, but it is out of our control. And so Solomon makes the same conclusion as before. Take pleasure in all your toil, verse 13. Be joyful and do good, verse 12. You don't have many days you have on this earth. Only God does, so you might as well enjoy the days you have. Only God's in control of time. In fact, as Solomon goes on to say, God is timeless. Whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it. Verse 14, nor taken away. Only God is outside time. The rest of us are victims of time, as it were. In fact, if you go on to think about that, you will realize that we are the same as the animals in that. Verse 19, we have breath, we die, we're dust. Verse 20, and to dust we shall return. Who knows whether the spirit of a man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down to the earth. Verse 21, who knows? We assume we're different, but at a mere glance, we are the same in death. The one difference, verses 16 through 17, is that for us there is a day of judgment. God will judge the righteous and the wicked. For us there is a time, and there is a time, as Solomon says, for every matter and for every work. So while Solomon again concludes that we should just enjoy our work, for that is our lot, verse 22, we need to keep in mind there's a judgment coming and that work will be judged. Chapter 4 is all about the perspective of others. Not really of others, but our perspective with others. 
we spend so much time trying to get ahead of the Joneses, so to speak, trying to compete and beat them out, and for what? It's just driving after the wind. It would be far better to live, not in getting ahead, but living in community with our fellow man. We can strive to get ahead by oppressing others, verses 1 through 4, or oppressing ourselves, verses 5 through 8, but in the end we have nothing. But if we lived for one another, uh, first we'd support one another, two, we'd be remembered well, because let's face it, if we get ahead, we still die, as we have seen. And if we die first, we'll be cursed by everyone who lived longer than us. What's the point? Well, there isn't one. It's far better to live in community as a good neighbor than in trying to get ahead. It's like speeding through town, trying to get ahead of the other cars. Eventually, you all have to stop at the same red light. Who cares if you got there first? Now you're all sitting at the same stoplight. What have you accomplished? Nothing. No one cares if you got to the red light first. They think you're dumb. You wasted extra gas. It's pointless. That's what Solomon is saying about life. Enjoy life with your fellow human beings. At least then life is enjoyable along the way, because eventually we're all going to die. Chapter 5 has to do, at least verses 1 through 7, with religion, one's relationship with God. Some look at these verses and see Solomon again as hedging his bets. Uh, don't be too religious, it won't get you anywhere. But really, Solomon is continuing the thought from chapter 4. Chapter 4 was about trying to get ahead of your neighbor through toil and oppression. Chapter 5 is about trying to get ahead with God through false hypocritical religiosity. God is not impressed. Too much talking with God, trying to say what we think God wants us to say without really meaning it, that's foolishness. Instead, it's best to consider the reality of what we've covered so far, realizing that God is sovereign, God is in control, and we aren't. God is in heaven, verse 2. You are on earth. Remember your place, a proper place. As David Gibson says, verses 1 through 3 are about an attitude of humility, properly listening to God. Verses 4 through 7 are about properly talking to God. Don't talk just for the sake of talking. Listen, speak wisely, even with God. Verses 8 through the end of the chapter are actually continuing a similar theme of worship. If verses 1 through 7 are about the worship of God, verses 8 through the end are about the pointless worship of anything else. You think power is great? No, there's always someone higher. You think money is great? Nope. Quote, the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. Verse 12. Hoarding riches? Again, pointless. Better to worship God and care for your fellow man than to step on him to get ahead. Proper worship of God leads to mercy, not oppression. Enjoy what God has given you, sure, but worship God properly, not your stuff. Chapter 6 really continues the same point, showing why riches and the like are stupid goals, dumb things to worship. In the end, you'll get nothing, and as we have seen, the rich will die and leave their riches to others. They cannot control what happens to their riches after they're gone, so don't worship the riches. Chapter 7 is an odd chapter, at least at first glance. It seems overly morbid, but instead Solomon is pointing out how we can respond to all that he has said. We can decide to eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, or we can allow the reality of our death to affect how we live. Every man dies, says Braveheart's William Wallace. Not every man truly lives. Really, according to Solomon, it's living in light of our death that makes the difference. The living, says Solomon in verse 2, will lay it to heart. The wise consider the end and live in light of it. Verse 8, better the end of a thing than the beginning. Wisdom, verse 13, considers the work of God, realizes he is in control, not man, and then lives accordingly. Of course, this is a rare occurrence, as Solomon says at the end of the chapter. Few live this way, realizing that death is coming. We don't like to think about it. But it causes us to stop and consider life and to live in the long term rather than the short. Not being self-righteous, since we realize in verse 15 that there is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness. Instead, we need to realize verse 20. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Instead, verse 29, men have sought out many schemes. We're easily tripped up, falling into wickedness. As Bartholomew says, Solomon's search, which he thought was taking him in the path of wisdom, led him right into the arms of Lady Folly. Instead, the one who pleases God escapes her. Human wisdom leads to wickedness and sin. Humility recognizes this, so is patient and slow to anger, and above all, gracious with others, not self-righteous, but humble, compassionate, and in submission to God. This long-term view is also the theme of chapter 8, how we live in relationship to God. 
if we live expecting immediate retribution, we will be disappointed and led into evil. But if we live with the long-term view, the view that realizes that we will all die, and then comes the judgment, then verses 11 through 13, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, I know that it will be well with those who fear God, because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked. Neither will he prolong his days like a shadow, because he doesn't fear God. In other words, the end is coming, even if we don't see it now. Even if it looks like the wicked are escaping, that's not the case. In the same way, just because we seem to be prospering doesn't mean we're righteous. Chapters 7 and 8 are very similar to the book of Job, recognizing that we cannot understand God's ways and God's timing. It's out of our ability to understand. Instead, we should enjoy the time that God has given us, realizing that God will work it all out in the end. Again, this is the long-term view that realizes we will all die, and then comes the ultimate judgment. We may see no justice until then, but it is coming in God's time, the one who makes all things beautiful in his time. In chapter 9, Solomon answers some of the thoughts, the reservations that we may be having. Yes, life is pointless from one perspective, since we cannot control everything. It's ephemeral, fleeting, a hevel, a mist, vanity. But life is still good. Better to be alive than dead, because the dead know nothing. But for us, who are alive, we can still enjoy life. And so Solomon says in verses 7 through 10 of chapter 9, Go, eat your bread with joy, drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white, let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love, all the days of your vain life that he's given you under the sun. Because that is your portion in life, and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For there is no work, or thought, or knowledge, or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. What Solomon is saying is that the perspective of realizing that you're not in control, that you're going to die, while depressing perhaps, is also freeing. Don't worry about the future. It's not your control anyway, so what's the point of fretting? Instead, enjoy the time that you have, the days you have now, the life you have now. Take pleasure in life because you will die. Make the most of today. This isn't carpe diem, as Sneed or Weeks calls it, but it appears that way. There's still a limit to this carpe diem, but you see how these scholars have reached this conclusion because that is how it appears. What the scholars miss, though, is why. It's not that life is pointless, so carpe diem sees the day, but a faith and a godly fear that realizes God has it under control. It's a freedom, an attitude that flows from a faith in Almighty God to be the one in charge. He doesn't need your help. You can't, by your vows, chapter 5, manipulate him. You can't, by your wisdom, understand or control him. So work hard and enjoy the life that he's given you. And yet still, in concluding chapter 9, Solomon says, wisdom is still better than folly. Enjoy life, but remember the limits. There is still a better way to live. This is not foolish revelry, not foolish carpe diem. Rather, this is the wisdom of a perspective of faith in action. Chapter 10 gives us some of those wise ways of living. There's still a better way to live, better than being foolish. Wisdom has some value, not for solving all the riddles of life, but there is a value even in the little things when it comes to wisdom. Better to be wise than a fool. Solomon has shifted focus a little bit here. He's pointed out why we live in light of the end. Now in chapter 10, he deals with life itself. Money, pointless. But in verse 19, not necessarily a bad thing. Toil and vanity, yeah, okay, sure. But you still need a roof over your head, verse 18. And it's better to toil for a good thing than a bad thing, verse 15. But wisdom knows that good thing. So there is a value of one thing over another. We just have to know a proper perspective of that value. A roof over your head will keep you dry, but it's not going to keep you from dying. Chapter 11, then, is a sort of summary. There are, as David Gibson says, three things we don't know. We don't know the future, verses 1 through 4. We don't know what, quote, only God can do, verse 5. And third, verse 6, we do not know how to guarantee success or failure. So what's the point? Well, we know that in light of these three things, we know that we don't know, we should have a loose grip then on our lives. Verse 2, give a portion. Uh, second, we should remember that there is a judgment coming. Verse 9, know that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. And so Gibson suggests that the point is not party hard but not too hard, 
but that instead God will judge us for not realizing that the days he has given us are a gift. For not investing them wisely and enjoying them, God will indeed judge us. And so, verse 3, we should enjoy life. Verse 7, life is sweet and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in all of them. But then remember that the days of darkness will be many. We are commanded by God to rejoice in our days as a gift, not a drudgery, not oppression. That comes later. For now, enjoy what you have, not caught up in what you don't have. Verse 10, remove vexation from your heart, put away pain from your body, for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. In other words, because we know that life has an end that is coming, and we know that life is fleeting and out of control, we should live in a particular way. This knowledge of the end affects our whole life. Chapter 7, chapter 10, chapter 11, but ultimately the point is that we should live in joy. Which leads to chapter 12. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth. We should enjoy life. It's bizarre that this is not at all where we thought we would end up. Who thought that the point of the book was to rejoice? It would appear that the scholar who says Solomon commands joy, Wybray, was correct. It's been the theme all along. Enjoy life. Enjoy work. Enjoy your toil. Why? Because you're going to die. It seems like those two ideas should be opposed to each other, but they're not. Instead, we live lives of such dissatisfaction because we forget that we're going to die. I'm, for instance, perpetually dissatisfied with the state of my yard and my landscaping. And yet, does it really matter? Fifty years from now, will anyone care about my landscaping? I probably won't live in that house in 70 years, and if I do, all the bushes I plant now will probably be dead by then. So what's the point? Well, there isn't one. So instead, enjoy the process of landscaping. Uh, I told my wife that I'm just going to bite the bullet one day and do the lawn exactly the way I want and do my landscaping exactly the way I want so that I'm satisfied and I can enjoy what it looks like. Living in light of the end, so to speak, realizing that the only thing I can do now is take joy from it, the joy of my garden. That's really Solomon's point. Living in light of the end actually increases joy, the joy of community, the joy of serving others. The joy of less anxiety about the future. It's not in your control anyway. This is the point that Solomon has been making, and he makes it again here at the end of the book. Verse 13, 14. The end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God. Keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every duty into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So enjoy life. Serve God. Live in light of the end. Uh, the book even closes with a warning about seeking out more wisdom, of listening to those who think they've got it all figured out. Besides being wise, the preacher taught great knowledge. Verse 12, my son, be aware of anything beyond these. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a wearisome of the flesh. In other words, there are all sorts of self-help books out there, but we don't need them. Well, we have this one. Uh, the self-help that those books don't ever give you is this. You're going to die. Realizing that according to Ecclesiastes, is what makes all the difference.